I'm going to start with my belief. I believe we are entering a new age of innovation. An age of innovation that will be mission-oriented public innovation to solve society's grand challenges. And in this new age of innovation, purposeful companies and civil society and government and public research organizations will be essential partners to deliver a triple bottom line of economic and social and environmental wealth. And I believe Canada can lead that movement. Three massive forces are converging to shape this new world future. First, the world is getting smaller. Public problems are no longer confined in a single community. They're shared across multiple communities. They're bigger, they're more complex. They're shared across the globe. Think of crop resiliency. Think of clean air. Think of clean energy. Think of cybersecurity. Think of antimicrobial resistance. Think of Zika virus. Think of Ebola. The list just keeps going. Second, the world is surprisingly finite. We are hitting sustainability limits on almost every dimension. And finally, social and environmental stability is becoming as important to us as pure economic growth. Third, the world is becoming more public. Public expenditure is a record 25 to 50 percent of every developed nation's GDP. And public engagement is increasing through instant communication and tons of online information. This is illustrated by the ABCs of clean air, also known as atmospheric brown clouds. Really, this is just smog. It's from burning fossil fuels, from burning biomass, and from burning crop waste. And in Southeast Asia, there is a gigantic brown cloud that hangs over most of that region of the world for three or four months every single year. It reduces needed rainfall, it reduces crop yield, and it causes health problems. In Delhi, as we recently saw, breathing the air in that city was deemed equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day. A 2005 Indian study of children in the city showed that their lung function has twice as many problems as rural kids, and half of those four million children, staggeringly, have some type of lung dysfunction from which they'll probably never recover. These problems will not be solved by the free market. No one will pay you to clean the neighborhood air. No mine operator can afford to clean up their tailings pile unless other people have to do it as well. And no biotech company can afford to do R&D to create a vaccine that society might just need in 10 years' time. In fact, as Sergio Marchionne, the CEO of Fiat Chrysler, taught me at a conference several years ago, these types of problems, this, this economic market, is not the place to decide our human values. In fact, it's the opposite, of course. Our human values decide the market. We decide how much air or water pollution is okay. We decide how long a drug patent should last. We even decide how long you can park in your own downtown, <laughs> okay? But the world is still changing here. And in those problems, <clears throat> that government role, that regulation role, is one important side of the problem. The other side of the problem is where my passion lies. How does innovation help solve these problems? How does R&D help solve these problems? How do we exploit R&D to solve these problems? How do we direct innovation to help us solve these problems? There's this myth that every great technology innovation comes from some startup garage in Silicon Valley. I lived in Silicon Valley for 15 years. I went to school there, I worked at Hewlett Packard at the Central Research Lab, and I can tell you that's only a little piece of the real story. In fact, 
every major technology innovation from Silicon Valley in the 20th century was the result of mission-oriented, defense-funded R&D. Hewlett Packard is a good example. It's a fantastic company, by the way. Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, two remarkable individuals. They didn't start their company because they wanted to get rich. They started their company as engineers because they thought they could build something that would make the world a better place. And when I started working there in 1999, there were 90,000 people working for that company. And I felt like I was working for two guys, one named Bill and one named Dave. And one of them was already dead. But I still felt I had to do what they thought was the right thing. So for you entrepreneurs out there, never underestimate the power you have as a founder to create a values-based organization. But how about R&D? And how about innovation at HP? What happened? Well, the fact is that that massive company actually grew up during the Second World War and after it with defense contracts. And they turned those technologies into subsequent custom electronics businesses. Even when I was there, and HP was approaching a $100 billion revenue, the advanced research lab that I worked in was 50% funded by the US government on defense R&D. The same story is true at IBM in the 1950s when they were trying to figure out how to build an automatic calculating machine. That R&D was paid for and the systems were purchased by the US Air Force who was trying to build a North American air defense system. The same story is true at AT&T Bell Labs, that icon of 20th century innovation the mecca for every physicist and electrical engineer in the world, the place that invented the transistor and the laser, the CCD that's inside every digital camera. Those things grew out of mission-oriented innovation, mostly funded by US defense goals. The same thing is true of this beloved iPhone that we all carry around. Every single major technology inside this thing came out of mission-oriented defense R&D, from the microprocessor to the GPS to the touchscreen to the wireless, even Siri. So what's the message here? Actually, the message is that mission-oriented innovation actually works. It works. And maybe surprisingly, it seems to produce these technologies that get reused again and again and again to create new value in other applications. So what do we need to do? We just need to take that skill set and direct it towards the society grand challenges. Are there any examples of this? Actually, the 1987 Montreal Protocol on Ozone is a good example. 1973, two professors, Frank Rowland, Mario Molina, at the University of California, first published a scientific paper linking chlorofluorocarbons with the ozone layer. Chlorofluorocarbons at that time, CFCs, were being used since 1930 in every refrigerator, every spray can, every hairspray bottle, and a number of other industrial processes like blowing foams. But it turns out that those CFC molecules, when they go up all the way to the top of the atmosphere, and they break up, they release a chlorine atom. And that's when the trouble really starts. Because each one of those chlorine atoms subsequently destroys tens or hundreds of thousands of ozone molecules. And it turns out that ozone is actually critical to life on Earth. That ozone layer absorbs almost all of the sun's high energy ultraviolet B light. Do you remember on a sunscreen bottle, it says UVB? It turns out that's actually really important, really important. That UVB is the sunburn-inducing, cancer-causing, DNA-destroying high-energy light. And without the ozone layer, that affects not only us, but our crops, plankton in the sea, disrupts the entire food supply of the world. So what happened next? Frank Rowland and Mario Molini were attacked by industry. 
One of the CEOs wrote to their chancellor and said they should be fired. Another one said, science fiction tale, complete rubbish. Nonetheless, science evidence continued to accumulate. And in 1985, we saw this smoking gun, this ozone hole over Antarctica. Civil society got involved as well. There were boycotts of CFCs here in Canada, in Norway, in Sweden, in the UK. The Prince of Wales even signed on. McDonald's had to stop using those clamshells, those foam clamshells. Anyone who's a little bit older remembers those things. And in 1987, the countries of the world came together in Montreal to declare a ban on those CFCs. Important in that, developing countries were given special consideration and additional funding to help with the transition. Those CFC producers were lobbying Congress right up until the signing of that treaty that this didn't need to happen, some of them. Nonetheless, in other places, in both the private sector and the public sector, scientists were inventing replacements. And it actually happened really quickly. A $30 million prize for a CFC refrigerator was posted by 24 different public and private energy utilities, and it was won only a couple of years later. So the story here is a complex interplay of civil society and science and the private sector and innovation in the public and the private sector and government regulation is needed to solve one of these grand challenges. And we also need a little bit of innovation for the innovators, actually. Those scientists and engineers, like myself, are not always in the closest touch with the rest of the real population. And so we will need for those scientists and engineers, as part of their education, additional problem-based learning, experiential-based learning, closer to the coal face with organizations that actually represent what real people are thinking about these problems. The other examples of this mission-oriented innovation also exist, and we can look to them to learn. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, it's a mouthful, is actually one of the most successful mission-oriented innovation agencies in the 20th century, defense-focused, but a new version of it in the US focused on clean energy is called ARPA-E, and it's off to a great start. The X Prize was this 2004 $10 million prize for the first manned space flight by a non-governmental organization. Now, that same organization has a handful of similar prizes, all focused on the betterment of humanity. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation awards two to five billion dollars every year focused on this type of grand social challenge, mission-oriented, and closer to home, Grand Challenges Canada uses the same model to address challenges in global health. I also believe in this new age of innovation that Canada is uniquely suited to lead. Why is that? Canada has an extraordinarily strong R&D base, scientific community. Canada also has both in the private sector and the public sector, a culture of open and inclusive and innovative approaches to tackle big problems. We are a nation of entrepreneurs. Canola is a fantastic Canadian story. In the 50s, Canada was looking for a way to reduce our dependence on imported edible oil and at the same time give prairie farmers another crop in addition to wheat to try and insulate some of those prairie farmers and their families from the wild fluctuations that wheat prices were going through in time. Rape seed had been planted in the 40s and it was a good lubrication oil, but some problems were starting to show up with human health consumption. Nonetheless, it was perfectly adapted to prairie agriculture, to farming methods, to crushing and production. So, scientists at the University of Saskatchewan, at the University of Manitoba, at Agriculture Canada, 
And at my own organization, the National Research Council of Canada, took on the Herculean task of hybridizing grapeseed strains to remove the harmful health components, to increase the yield of the healthy oil, to increase the nutrition value of the husks, and to improve the crop yield. And this took an amazing collaboration between those breeders and the farmers and the crushers and the producers and nutritionists in both animal and human health. And today, canola oil is a $19 billion crop for Canada, second only to wheat. It's a more desirable crop on the prairies now than wheat is, and it's grown around the world. So when we succeed at one of these grand challenges, when we succeed economically and socially and environmentally, and when we share that success with the world, then I believe we are sharing the best part of our community and of our society with the world. And that's also why I truly love this remarkable nation called Canada. This nation that is an idea in the process of being realized, as rhymed our spoken word artist Shane Coison. I have two school-aged daughters, and I go to events or performances at their schools every year, and every year I get goosebumps. Not because of their participation in the performance, but I am proud of that. I get goosebumps because I see groups of young people that are all differently dressed. They're obviously from different cultures around the world. And when I look at my daughters, they just see other kids. It's amazing. And those kids are interacting, they're debating social and environmental issues in an open and inclusive and creative way. And that character of open and inclusive and creative discussion is exactly what's needed for Canada to succeed in this new age of public innovation. And that is the Canada and the world that I want to live in. Thank you.